the Radical Secular Podcast, a demand for justice, equality, and rational public policy. Welcome to the Radical Secular Podcast. I'm Joe Kipinti. I'm Sean Prophet. I'm Christoph Defoe. Welcome, everyone. I'm very excited to be able to introduce to you uh, the great work of my lifelong friend, Justine Burt. There she is. I've known Justine for close to 30 years, and in all that time, she has worked diligently to help the world become a better place. Truly, she is among the most dedicated people I've ever had the pleasure of knowing. Before we begin our interview, I want to remind you all, if you like our show, make sure to subscribe, leave a review, and tell your friends to listen. New episodes post on Mondays at noon Eastern on YouTube and all the major podcast channels. And if you're into reading, check out the blog at theradicalsecular.com. Visit our website at theradicalsecular.com and sign up for free access to exclusive content and giveaways, our full library of episodes, and articles at the Radical Secular blog. Email us with your comments and suggestions, and follow us on social media. But first, the news. We have so much to talk about on this show, I want to keep the news segment short and sweet for this week. Sean, Christoph, and Justine, what do the viewers need to know? What are the key highlights for the for the week? Hmm, what are they? Well, there's a normal, uh, you know, batshit from uh, Capitol <laughs> Hill, uh, right? I mean, like it, it, a sort of an interesting twist before, and I'll I'll kick it off to Sean after this, but. Um, DMX died this week and, and it's, you know, it, it, I'm not a hero worshiper. Uh, I'm not, I'm not even a hip hop guy, a hip hop fan. I'm, I'm a rock and roll person. I'd like rock and roll, but DMX was sort of like a, this sort of a figure growing up. And I always loved the rawness of it. And he really embodied sort of the post eighties crack epidemic nineties era gangster rap sort of, um, you know, we sling crack in the projects mass incarceration he like embodied that and sort of in in with uh with an emotion and he died ultimately because he because of drugs right and Mm -hmm. this is also sort of reflects the experience that he had growing up in the projects right and 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 struggling with drugs so anyway that was i think an interesting thing but um of course there was a ton of things going on at capitol hill sean what do you want to say about that well the first thing i just in a very few words matt gates is fucked (laughs) <laughs> uh his his co-conspirator is is rolling on him and uh, is going to testify so i mean it's all over but the but the but the shouting so um but i wanted to also talk about a couple significant developments that in the scramble to line up support for passing president biden's infrastructure bill which would also raise corporate taxes the senate parliamentarian has announced that there would be additional opportunities this year to pass two more bills using budget reconciliation which allows them to pass with 50 votes. So it's it's super important. I can't em- overemphasize what a huge deal this is. Um, but <laughs> uh, on cue, Senator Joe Manchin reiterated that he's not going to support ending the filibuster, which also probably means he's not going to vote for Biden's bill without Republicans. So it's kind of you know, two steps forward, two steps back at this point. Uh, He's demanded that Republicans be included in negotiations, stating that the January 6, 2021 U.S. Capitol attack had, quote, changed him, and he wants to insist on bipartisanship. Unfortunately, the track record of Republican obstructionism is so disgraceful that it's incredibly difficult to imagine Manchin is making this demand in good faith. He's shaping up at this point to be the Washington power player, second only to President Biden, and it's pretty clear that he will end up being the deciding vote on any bills that will pass before the 2022 election. And that's probably going to spell some trouble for the Biden agenda. And certainly it's going to cut it down from what could have been accomplished. So we'll have to see how it plays out. And I, I just want to mention one other thing, and that is the sad news that there were multiple mass shootings this week. In fact, there was one every yep. day. And we seem to be returning to the sort of pre-pandemic old normal. But this is not normal, folks. Uh, so I'm just going to go through them because we have to, we have to, we have to honor the dead. We have to really just, you know, make this conscious. So, uh, Dallas, Texas, April 5th, tragic situation involving six gun deaths, which was an immigrant family from Bangladesh in which two brothers made a suicide pact and then killed four other family members in New York city on April 6th, another typical male rage killing. A man went to his nine-year-old daughter's birthday party and later in the evening shot the mother of his child and two of her other daughters then killed himself. The nine-year-old, fortunately, was unharmed physically, but she's going to be 
destroyed mentally. So uh, in Rock Hill, South Carolina, on April 7th, a prominent doctor and his wife and their two grandchildren were shot by former NFL player Philip Adams, who then killed himself. And on April 8th in Bryan, Texas, a gunman shot six people. One died and the rest are hospitalized for in critical condition. I just I hate having to talk about these every week, but we can never, ever act like this is normal. It's it's just a an ongoing disgrace. And it's the direct result of that terrorist organization, the NRA. Enough said. So I'm sure there's a lot of other things we could talk about, including many states opening up their COVID-19 vaccinations to all adults. I got my first shot of Pfizer on Tuesday. But that's enough news for now. I'll turn it over to you, Joe, so we can spend the most time with today's guest. Sure. Thank you. Um, Christoph or Justine, do you have anything you want to add? I mean, I'll just add that with respect to, um, first of all, the gun deaths are, it's just relentless. It's awful. It's cons- its consistent. Um, and, uh, you know, there was, um, speaking of guns, speaking of deaths, uh, right, you had um, uh, in Virginia this week, this just uh, came out. It was, I think it was actually last month, but uh, but the uh, footage came out this week, and that was a police officer pulling over a guy who was a uh, army vet. Uh, literally, no, I'm sorry, active army. Um, and uh, and and I mean, the the video is so shocking. It, and he wasn't shot, but this guy was frightened to get out of the car. He put his hands outside of the car, and he says, "Look." The truth is, I'm afraid that if I get out of the car, you're going to shoot me, right? Like mm-hmm. that, and and he, and this is all on the body camera, and it is yeah. just so visceral. And right. this guy, this guy is uh, active duty, so calm, compliant. He's a, he's a lieutenant. A lieutenant. This is not some schmuck. And by the way, what kills me too is that he, what he drove, they, they were so angry because when they pulled him over, he drove an extra mile down the road because he wanted to be in a very well lit environment. Because again, he was afraid if he got out of the car in a dark environment, he would end up shot. And that is the sort of situation that we are facing yeah. as a nation and as a community. It is appalling. And so um, I, I just saw that today and I, I was just, I mean, I, I don't even know what to say about that in the, in the Chauvin trial and everything that's been happening. It, it's, it's, it's emotionally very taxing. And so like a lot of times I just put it out of my mind and block it out, but then it gets like, it comes yelling back from time to time. And so I just think that's worth mentioning uh, also before we move on. Yeah, thank you, Christophe. I think you're absolutely right about that. Of course, before I we do- I just wanted to tie it two things sure. together, which is talking about gun policy, which you mentioned, and <clears throat> the infrastructure bill that, that Biden's been pushing, the $2 trillion. Oh. And mm. I wonder if the infrastructure bill represents an inflection point in the country. I mean, I was just reading, to pull a few things together. Um, we shouldn't be calling it gun control. We should call it gun policy. And yes. If you look at the National Rifle Association. Great point. Most people don't know that their annual revenues are like three hundred fifty million dollars. I mean, that's part of the reason why oh. these ten gun policy changes that a majority of Americans, Republicans and Democrats, support universal background checks, with making sure mentally ill don't have access to guns. Like there are the ten policies that a majority of Americans, a supermajority for most of them support and yet because the nra has 350 million dollars in revenues every year we can't get it so i just wonder if this violence economy that is is at the foundation of our economy here is at an inflection point i mean we have unlimited funds republicans want unlimited funds for military weapons border control prisons surveillance that's the violence economy but what we need more of is the care caring economy the care economy and infrastructure rebuilding, restoring is, is part of that. And a lot of those are green jobs. So and right. that helps segue into what I want to talk about. But, um, yeah, that's a brilliant segue and and right on point. Thank you so much for bringing that up. Yeah, it does. And that's why we have, we have, you know, we're very happy to have you here, have you on the show. Uh, so let's turn to uh, Justine and, and um, her book, The Great Pivot. Also, would like to talk a little bit about the Thrives Act in the end of the show, because it's so relevant to this discussion. So we are joined by Justine Burt. Let me tell you a little bit about her. Uh, Justine is currently the program lead for Future of Work, a nonprofit workers advocacy group called Manzanita Works in Palo Alto, California. She has spent much of her professional life as a sustainability consult consult, uh, for energy efficiency, alternative transportation, waste prevention, and many other similar issues. She has worked with NASA's AIM Research Center with the U.S. House of Representatives, with many local governments, 
private businesses and universities. Am I missing anything, Justine? No, that's, that's enough. <laughs> All right, that's good. <laughs> so I've been, and it's a great, you know, it's a great resume, and it's it's a it's a wonderful, uh, you know, vocation that you've you've embarked upon in your life. We we're very grateful for it. I know I am. I've been teaching about social and ecological sustainability for more than twenty years in my own work. And I found your book, The Great Pivot, to be timely, comprehensive, and detailed. Uh, your focus is both on human flourishing and ecological stewardship. And you show how the two things are so intrinsically interrelated. I appreciate the emphasis on the economy, and particularly in highlighting the way societies can create a healthier, more sustainable place in this incredible and precious living planet. I really enjoyed your book, Justine. And I'm not just saying that. I really did. It's all, it's not only how forward-looking it is, but also how it provides us with a blueprint to move forward. And so we are very happy to have you here. Thanks. You're yeah, very welcome. Absolutely. I mean, I just want to say that when I heard that you were coming on the show and I read your book, I'm just super excited because I, I, I'm kind of a geek in these areas and your book is just super impressive. So, Wow. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so it, 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 I, I, I frankly didn't get to finish your book, um, but I am, but I've uh, been looking forward to being here. And and what's really this is an area for me which is uh, not sort of where I'm in the weeds. So um, uh, this is an area that is uh, very much a topic for learning for me. So I'm looking forward to hearing your expertise on these issues. And uh, it's it, it's it's fascinating stuff and great work that you're doing. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Well, I wrote the book in part because I was concerned about outsourcing millions of jobs and automating away millions of jobs. And I was looking at the fact that 4.2 million people drive for a living while Elon Musk was talking about self-driving, rolling out self-driving tractor trailers and taxis and wondering what is the future of work going to look like? Are we just going to let you know, automation continue to happen, which honestly, we need automation to get rid of dull and dangerous jobs, mm -hmm. but we don't need automation to get rid of all the jobs. We, there's, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And so, so that, that was kind of my frame of mind when I was writing the book and then the pandemic happened mm -hmm. and Biden came right. into office after Trump just made a huge mess with the economy <laughs> and Officially, when Biden came into office, we were down 10 million jobs below where we were before the pandemic started. But that's just the official unemployment rate, the U3 unemployment rate that we all hear about. Right. There, he actually came into office with us being down 26 million jobs, because if you count all the people who have given up looking for work or the people who had a few interviews last year, but nothing came through or people working part time, eight hours here, eight hours there with no benefits who really want full-time work with benefits, it's 26 million Americans. And we could easily create 26 million green jobs. Yeah, 26 million. Wow. I mean, that's that's a staggering number, isn't it? Well, but first, before we get to this stuff, which we will delve into in great detail, let's talk about our T-shirts, as we usually do in this show. So here's mine. You guys are going to love this one. Uh, oh, look at that. It's just great because it's all of everybody who's out there listening. It is all the uh, various ships from the um, from and, the big from the big five uh, shows uh, from Star Trek. And then the captains in the middle, right? And the captains. So you have uh, Enterprise. You have uh, Enterprise the original. You have you have the Enterprise D. You have the Defiant, and you have uh, Voyager. And and what you have one more there. What's the last one on the end? Uh, Archer's Enterprise. Oh, yeah. Archer's Enterprise, right? Yes. The uh, yeah. the NX, the NX01, yeah. the NX01. <laughs> and so beautiful. It, it, it isn't just that we're we're Star Trek geeks here; is that we feel that Star Trek has a lot of lessons for us. We really do. But we can talk a little bit about that too at some point. Uh, so, uh, Chris, Christoph, and Sean. Uh, yeah. So um, I'm wearing my uh, science slash Darwin shirt. Um, it's got like the, uh, it looks like the uh, Jesus fish, except for it has the walking, you know, it's turned into a walking spaceship thing. It has um, rocket fins. <laughs> right, rocket fins. Uh, so uh, I, I, it's funny because this is, this show is, it seems to me is, 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 science is a sort of core element of it. I, but I was really close to what wearing a Star Trek shirt. I'm kind of, I kind of wish I had now, you know, I have so many of them. I could definitely could have pulled one out, but anyway, yeah. whatever. <laughs> Mine is there is no planet B and this right. is, I've worn this before, but it's absolutely mm -hmm. uh, appropriate for today's show. So 
Perfect. Right on brand. I put a dark green t-shirt on and my husband said, are you wearing that on the podcast? (laughs) (laughs) Of course. (laughs) I put my fancy black shirt on. (laughs) Well, it looks very nice. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I've done that myself in the show. So open canvas, right? An empty canvas to to be filled. Uh Let's start with let's start with your book. um, The Great Pivot. It It outlines like 30 green job projects under five key headings. In a general sense, can you tell us a little bit about that? Tell us about these projects. Um, So the five areas are energy, uh, so clean energy, clean transportation, a circular economy, which means instead of extraction, manufacturing, use, disposal, that we prevent waste and reuse and recycle. And the fourth area is reducing food waste. Do you, do you guys know what percentage of all the food we raise and grow is thrown away? If you add up at the farm, at the distribution center, grocery store, restaurants, homes, what percentage of all that food that we work so hard to raise and grow is thrown away in our country? You want to guess? Yeah, I think you said, didn't, didn't you say in the book it was half? Yeah, it's 40%, which is, which is tragic at a time when like one in four people are food insecure. Like they don't know where one of the meals each day. So... Yeah. Energy, transportation, <clears throat> circular economy, reducing food waste, and restoring nature, restoring healthy forests, healthy waterways, uh, healthy soil. We could be sequestering carbon in the soil and restoring wildlife population. Um, I, I was asking my sister over the holidays, uh, do you know what percentage of wildlife we've lost since 1970? That's a tragedy. I don't know, 25%? Like it's wow. 70%. Wow. 70% of all the creatures that used to be walking around this planet in 1970 are what we have now. So wow. it's time to turn all that around. And that's the caring economy that we need to decarbonize buildings, decarbonize energy, decarbonize our transportation, create a circular economy dramatically reduce food waste so we can divert edible food to people who can, can use it and then restore our nation. Um, there's 30 projects in, in those five areas. Yeah, um, those are some powerful numbers, Justine. And, and I know sometimes we just gloss them over. You know, we hear 40% of food is being wasted, but think about it. I mean, just think about how much the massive volume of resources and energy that it takes to, to produce that much food. And then the other number, even more staggering, 70% of uh, wildlife eradicated in the last 40 years or something like that. And I've seen those numbers. It's just heartbreaking. Um, what do you guys think? It, it's, it, it's astonishing, frankly, and, um, and, and really depressing. I mean, you know, we talked about Star Trek earlier. We're talking about that later. We're talking about the these sort of these global issues, and I wonder if it's the what fat, the way that our brains as humans develop that we just don't think about. Mm. We don't tend to think about these things in these big, broad these these numbers and these figures are are, are so overwhelming. Um, I, I it feels like my brain's just not capable of wrapping it wrapping my mind around that. It's just good wow. point. Yeah. Well, one of the things I would mention is that if you remember driving. Uh, 40 years ago, 45 years ago, and how many bugs you would get on the windshield compared to how many bugs you get on the windshield now. It's astounding. I mean, Mm. I remember we used to have to scrape. My family had an RV. We used to have to scrape the windshield, especially driving around in the South. And um, now it's just like, no, hardly anything. And, it, you know, it's great for, you know, riding motorcycles and stuff like that. You don't have to deal with as many bugs, but this it's it's horrific for the biosphere. But um, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about, about Justine's book, which I thought was excellent. Um, and I, I especially liked your specific proposals for the sustainable and meaningful jobs that you just mentioned. And <clears throat> I love that you mentioned in the book, David Graeber's bullshit jobs because yeah. that that is such, such a great a, book such an incredible book and and this is when i get into conversations with people about basic income and about other things and they talk about how we can't afford it and everything else like that and i go hey we're paying 50 percent of the people to sit around and do nothing so um <laughs> basically <laughs> already so you know um the other thing is i really liked that you referenced paul hawkins book drawdown and and that that is that is excellent. And I wanted to mention right there that the top thing that he mentions in that book is dealing with air conditioning refrigerants. The the top way that we can fix the climate above everything else, above cars, trucks, above you know dealing with with animal agriculture, it's dealing with those refrigerants. And so uh, that's something that 
I, I, you know, it blows me away every time I think about it, that we're throwing the earth away over refrigerants that we're just letting escape into the atmosphere. Um, we need to figure out refrigeration because you know what? The earth's only going to get hotter. And mm -hmm. in 2040, we're projecting tripling energy use because yeah. more and more people in developing nations are going to need, I mean, they already need air conditioning they don't have it, but everyone deserves to have the basics. And and if it's now the number one contributor to climate change, then we need to figure that out and find an alternative. Yeah. Certainly. Yeah. And then so I also wanted to mention the books Cradle to Cradle and by Michael Brongart and William McDonough and another book by the same authors, The Upcycle. Uh, and then there was Natural Capitalism and Reinventing Fire by Amory Lovins. Your book is newer and more updated than all of those and includes more info on chronic unemployment, economic inequality. And I also really appreciated the section where you discussed how GDP doesn't really measure our true progress because you don't really hear you hear a lot of economists talk about that, but you don't hear a lot of in, in, environmentalists talk about that. So um, your book is really a one stop shop for anyone who cares about positive change and who doesn't want to read all those other books. You have to read about 20 books to get the what's in yours. <laughs> Well, I appreciate uh, your podcast here, and I listened to Roots of Our Rage this morning, and just really loved it. I'm like, oh my god, this can be better than I thought it was. <laughs> awesome. Riff on David Graeber's definition of bullshit jobs for a minute. Like, this seems like the place to do that. I mean, okay. I have the definition right here. It says bullshit job is a form of paid employment that's so completely pointless, unnecessary, or pernicious that even the employee can't justify its existence. Even though as part of the conditions of employment, the employee feels obliged to pretend that it's not the case. And in one interview, yeah. David Graber, David Graber said, um, you know, if, if anything came out of my research, it's if the person who holds a job is the only one who gets to decide if they think it's bullshit or not. And and just after he wrote that strike article, Bullshit Jobs or Rant, he people tweeted, hundreds of people tweeted him to talk about how how much they hated their jobs and it it just created this void in their soul. So I think people deserve meaningful work. I mean, there are 200,000 property managers in the Department of Defense, and we're spending $125 billion over five years for, for them. So like, yeah. could, we, could we like create more of jobs that give people purpose and meaning and like maybe cut away some of the jobs that don't make people's soul thin? People deserve better, I think. Yeah, I mean, even uh, I mean, Karl Marx talked about it with alienation of of uh, work, and he he, he gave a huge uh, you know uh, treatise on that. And we've just learned so much more since then, right? About the uh, what it means to be to be uh, to have a flourishing life, and one of them is to is to have meaningful work. Mm -hmm. But I I do agree, uh, you know, with Sean. I, I'm really struck by just how forward thinking and how positive your book is, Justine. And it really focuses on solutions and it's visionary in that way. And I love that. We all love that. It's one of the reasons why, we, like we were talking about before, that we love Star Trek because here on the show, we're, we're, uh, we believe in that vision that's presented. And, you know, and I mean, Mark, what do you think? Am I right, guys? It gives me goosebumps. Uh, you know, the Star Trek, the um, this why it gives me goosebumps, I guess, is that that forward looking, that inspirational, the combination. I think the book um, uh, and uh, the book and the Thrive Act and the things that we're talking about today really sort of hit those notes. Right. They are a comprehensive rethinking about how we do economy, how we do society, how we interact with each other and how we interact with the planet. And that is sort of the bones of the Star Trek franchise, right? And that is, uh, it, it, it's inspiring. Yeah, and one of the things I wanted to mention about it is a lot of what makes Star Trek work is all of the things that we've left behind, the bad ideas that we've left behind. And right. underlying mm -hmm. the, uh, and, and Graeber talks about this in his book, underlying all of the bullshit jobs is the Puritan work ethic. The idea that somebody has to be busy doing something at, at, at all times. And it just, and even if the thing is meaningless, the idea of paying somebody to sit and do something that they enjoy, right? That they don't hate is, is really drives a lot of people nuts. And so in order to really get past that, we have to focus on both ethics and systems. And, you know, what Star Trek gets right is a lot of the, I mean, every show almost has an ethical dilemma. And, and it's not just that, it's specific respect for non-human forms of life. And right. that is one of the things 
<laughs> that it gets lost when we talk about the biosphere with people who don't understand what's going on. And uh, they think an, the environment is just about, okay, well, changing your light bulbs or recycling or whatever. They don't understand what is going on with the biosphere. And we, we talk about the consequences of resource depletion, pollution, and climate change for human civilization. Everybody's like, oh, it's going to be a disaster. Uh, then they talk about economics and uh, they don't, think about the impact that we're having on non-human species. So just wanted to put that out there. Oh, I'm so glad you made that point. It is an excellent point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as the science fiction, we should do a show on it. Maybe not just Star Trek, but maybe science fiction in general, how it so powerfully looks at society in the future. Uh, there's so much to talk about, so many great books and shows and films that have tackled the issues of social justice, what it means to be human, what, what it means to thrive, you know, and Obviously, there's a huge dystopic side to science fiction, which is also very, you know, it, it provides great lessons as well. Uh, I'm watching the last season of uh, The Handsmaid's Tale, and man, I mean, it's, it's powerful stuff. I mean, it's hard to watch. Uh, and there's a lot to learn from that show as well. What do you think? Well, I mean, I'm a lifelong sci-fi fan, not just of TV shows, but books. A big fan of David Brin, Robert Heinlein, mm -hmm. Ray Bradbury, Philip K. Dick, Roger Zelazny, Philip Jose Farmer, Isaac Asimov, Arthur C. Clarke, all the greats. Um, one of my favorite quotes from Arthur C. Clarke, it's relevant to the show, is nature is a very strict accountant and always balances her books. Mm. That is from the Songs of Distant Earth. And I wanted to mention the most recent sci-fi book that I read, which is called Models and Citizens by Andrew Sweet. I read this book in one sitting. It's it's set in the late 22nd century, and it's a really great allegory for our current racial conflicts. But instead of mistreating people based on their race or immigration status, that society is dealing with uh, chronic discrimination against human clones who are treated as slaves, and they've been stripped of their U.S. citizenship. So it's a powerful story that has a lot of implications for today's world. And that's what I think is so great about dystopian sci-fi is because mm -hmm. by setting a story in the future, it strips away all the political excuses right. that people have for tolerating the intolerable. And so, you know, readers are presented then with an ethical dilemma that's clarified by removing their frames of reference to the status quo. And so Andrew Sweet, the author of that book, was a guest on our show a few weeks back. And I, I had no idea that he'd written this book at the mm -hmm. time. And we're definitely gonna have to have him back uh, on the Radical Secular to talk about it. Yeah, for sure. And funny enough, I've already I've already talked to him about that because he wrote oh, a blog. Okay. He wrote a, he wrote a blog post for us uh, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, he's great, Andrew, uh, great guy, uh, but former uh, military, just a great guy all around. But bottom, what I'm getting at is that he uh, we already discussed that he he's definitely going to come back on the show. It's we just have to schedule it. So Paul, hopefully mm -hmm. within the next month or so. So. <laughs> All right. Well, so radical secular fans, look for our show coming up on science fiction. Uh, but we, and also with that in mind, let's start this conversation with what I think is actually the easiest part of the solution: uh, green technologies. Then we can move to the harder stuff: politics and culture. Man, green tech has come a long way. Can you name uh, one or two key technologies that would help us uh, lead us to the kind of world you describe in your book, Justine? And then say something about how these technologies can be put into practice. Well, I'd love to see more solar microgrids. And one project I'm working on right now actually is um, taking some of the 10,000 K through 12 public schools and private schools in California and turning them into solar microgrids. And so if you're not familiar, that would be solar photovoltaics, with energy storage, electric mm -hmm. vehicle charging, and then intelligence. So there's monitoring, communications, and controls. I'm sure you guys heard about the wildfires out here last fall. Four yep. million acres burned. PG&E turned off the power at various times just so when the winds were picking up, and sparks wouldn't fly and, and start another wildfire. I mean, we need emergency backups out here for now. At some point, the 8.0 or the 9.0 earthquake's going to hit, and then... You know, we need to be able to have the police fire hospitals running. So if you have solar microgrids at the public schools, then they can serve as emergency shelters mm. with lights and yeah. duration. If the power's out, if there's blackouts, if there's natural disaster. So I would love to see this kind of, and, and the solar would run normally anyway. And having energy storage would allow you to, you know, have the electricity generated in the middle of the day when, when the sun's out and then sell it into the grid for more when it's more expensive from 4 to 8 p.m. when people are powering everything up. 
So solar microgrids is something I'd like to see a lot more of, especially at places where that we need running um, during emergencies. And the other, the other piece of technology I would love to see more of at further developed is mobility as a service. It would be nice if there were an app that you could put on your phone that would allow you to plan, okay, I need to travel from Palo Alto to Berkeley. Mm -hmm. What's the cheapest, fastest way I can do it? And let me just go pay for all three of those. Like what has the, the fewest, you know, transfers and, you know, lost time. Every time you transfer from a train to a bus to an Uber, you lose time. So like what's the fastest, cheapest way to get there? We don't currently have something that can plan and let you pay for transportation. So we can take alternative transportation, not just all of us always have to get in our car and drive our gas powered vehicle. What's most exciting to me uh, are some of the existing technologies. And that's pretty much what you just said, Justine. I mean, the, the solar microgrid technology has been around for years and it's getting better, obviously, but certainly it's just a matter of political will and and putting these things into place. And I think that another one of the, that has not gotten enough attention is geothermal energy because there's more than enough accessible geothermal to run the whole world. And unlike wind and solar, it's always available. My hope is that we can get the oil and gas industry to take their incredible expertise in drilling and hydro fracturing and apply it to heat mining, which is bringing up heat from deep in the Earth's crust and using it directly to either make electricity or heat buildings or cool buildings even. So um, I think there's a lot of money to be made. And again, it's a, it's a, a triple win for the planet and for the economy. Uh, the second technology that really needs to ramp up at the same time, of course, is energy storage, as you mentioned, because renewable energy sources uh, other than geothermal are intermittent. Storage becomes an absolutely vital part of the grid. And there's so many great ways to store energy and get it back when you need it. Of course, there's grid scale batteries and those are great, but there's also uh, micro batteries, as you mentioned, and things like uh, compressed air, flywheels, pumping water up to a higher level, running it through a generator on the way down, uh, lifting heavy bricks attached to cables or having trains go up and down hills. The possibilities to remake our energy system with a combination of geothermal and storage and, and solar microgrids are just endless. We could have easily 100% renewable grid in 15 years if we really tried. And that means we could phase out all coal, natural gas, and even nuclear. It takes investment and we need to be doing more of this. And the side benefit, of course, is resilience when there are disasters. So that's those are- Absolutely, yeah. And you know, it, the reason why I said this is the easy stuff, it, it isn't easy. It's, I mean, incredibly challenging technologically, but we've come so far and the momentum is there. There's so much innovation, so much, uh, uh, you know, dynamism going on in this field that it would not be a problem. The, the, the real issue here, the real thorny stuff that we're talking about is um, the, like you said, Sean, it's the politics, it's the culture. That's what we need to really focus on. What are the, these road blockages that we're constantly coming up against. Um, is cool tech enough? It's is it enough to to buy an electric car and put put solar panels on your roof? Should we not also be talking about? And, and I think you folks have already alluded to this: how society works in a more fundamental level. We need to be looking at deeper things than simply replacing one product with another product, even mm -hmm. if it is a green product. I mean, don't you think it's not just us in the developing world we, think we need to think about? We need to we want everyone to have benefits of a modern middle class first world life that's sustainable. Uh, and is that possible within the framework of having a thriving, sustainable world? L let me be more specific. Uh, let's start with, like, let's say cars. Right? We have this massive highway system in the U.S. By materials used, it's the biggest public works project in the history of the world. And it's terribly inefficient in terms of energy use. And uh, you talk about low carbon mobility projects in your book, Justine. Uh, tell us about them. What should we be thinking about here? What are the, the, some of the more fundamental issues? Well, just questioning the way we do everything, because the conventional way we do most things is not the sustainable way. Um, one interview I was, I was giving a guy asked me, um, this is at Singularity University, he's like, do we even need to work? Like, do we have to work? Like, do we have to have jobs? And I said, well, we do until we make the transition. Like, the conventional way we do everything is not the sustainable way. We burn fossil fuels for our, our space heating, our water heating, our drying, our cooks, many of our cook stoves. 
we burn gasoline in our cars, we need to switch over to different technologies that have a lower impact on the environment. I mean, right down the street at Stanford University, Mark Jacobson and his graduate students figured out for every state in the United States, what would be the mix if it were 100% renewables for everything. Mm -hmm. And he calculated this would be 5.2 million jobs, construction and then operations jobs. 5.2 million jobs. And, yeah. then they, and now they're calculating for every country in the world, what would it take, what would the mix of renewables look like if you were 100% renewable? I mean, there's a lot of work to change over the way we do things. So we do need green jobs at this point. Maybe at some point we all can do the things we really love, like painting or playing music or, you know, hanging out with friends at a picnic in the park. But for now, there's, there's work that needs to be done. There's way from bullshit jobs to the work that really needs to be done to enable this. Yeah, that's um, that's really that's I think really really interesting, and I'm thinking now about the political will, right? And one of the things that jumped out at me, Justine, as you were talking, and and you too, Joe, is the problem of uh, of of being radical, being willing to radically rethink a uh, radical secular, right? Radically rethink the way we approach these problems right so i think um later on we're going to talk about uh we're going to talk about meat and vegetarianism but like right you know conservatism tends to sort of uh, latch its identity to these legacy items like mm -hmm. having a coal rolling truck right is sort of somehow manly and um you know uh, it, instead of cooperation domination right um and uh, and and so protecting your home and blah, blah, blah. and so and then these ideas I think end up getting uh, sort of are just such impediments to uh, to radically rethinking how we do things. It, it, it's so such that people can't even wrap their minds around the uh, think doing things doing things differently. And and then what happens on top of that? Because that's the feeling I think the sort of gut sort of conservative feeling, right? The, 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 the resistance to change. And then do then they pile on bad faith arguments, right? So that's the, that's that's sort of the, the icing on top, which is like, oh no, it's going to cost so much money. We're going to talk about how much these things cost them um, and later on in the show. It's not going to work because it'll cost so much money. Oh, I'm not going to be able to eat meat. Oh, I don't want to be able to drive my car. So anyway, um, I just think, so as you were talking, that's sort of the things that jumped into my head, um, but uh, really interesting stuff. Yeah. yeah. I, I just want to say uh, also sure. that, I mean, this, what Christoph is talking about, the resistance is huge. Everything from, you know, mask wearing uh, and getting people into uh, into alternative transportation are the same problem. Because yes, people yes. have have associated their individual freedom with having an individual car, and you know I I, I could talk about transportation all day. It's huge. Uh, um, I love public transportation. I love electric cars. But what I especially love are autonomous electric cars because it severs the connection between the personal vehicle, right? Because it it, it solves parking. It solves this problem, Justine, that you were talking about about multimodal transportation being able to plan your trip. And, you know, at a certain point, uh, you know, an autonomous car just comes and picks you up. It takes you to, your, to the next part of your journey. And, you know, that will slash car ownership. It will allow cutting down on parking. And, you know, the parking subject doesn't really get enough attention at all. And you mentioned it in your book. Um, parking lots are one of the biggest wastes of prime mm. urban spaces in existence. Even cutting down parking by half would allow cities to either be more dense or do things like open up green spaces and gardens. And autonomous vehicles are going to be super transformational because you'll be able to do this thing, like you said, on your cell phone, where you have a mobility plan and it's like, it's like Uber, but you've paid by the month. And so you have a certain number of miles and you could just go wherever you want, picks you up exactly when you need it. No parking, no insurance, no maintenance, no DUIs, no repairs, you know, just a low fee to get where you want to go. So uh, that, that excites me. Yeah, yeah. cars sit unused 94% of the time, if we could put them into better use to have them doing more work to serve more people to get them where they need to go. But I think electric bikes are also a big, big opportunity. 48% of all of the trips of people who live in urban and suburban areas are within three miles or less. And if you can hop, it's so fun. We just got one a few months ago. Mm. It's like, you feel like a superhero. You just barely tap on the pedal and you're going 20 miles an hour. So could that <laughs> replace some of the trips where we're getting in a car, turning the key and burning gasoline? I just think it's, it's something we need to chip away at. And, and at the same time, you don't start with the laggards to like make change. Like forget about the 
curmudgeons who just want to argue with you about why it's not going to work. Mm. And in the diffusion of innovation curve, which I know we've all seen, you've got the innovator and then the early adopters, the early majority, then you work on the majority, and then there's a late majority, and the laggards are at the end. So, so if you, of course, the curmudgeons are going to want to argue with you about why the change you want to make doesn't make sense, but they'll, they're dementors and they're going to like suck all the joy in, of, out of your life if you let them focus on the early adopters, show, take the proof of concept from the innovation and then expand it from there. I mean, that's how we just use innovations throughout society. Yes, we're creating jobs. We're giving people an ability to support themselves and their families. Would you like a job too? We've got 15 million of them here <laughs> with our infrastructure bill and and uh, there's, there's just so much opportunity. We start with the proofs of concept and then we replicate and scale. I think that's the way you know, and you guys, you guys have mentioned some great projects, some great possibilities. I want, I just want to focus on something Christoph said though about the radical nature of change, and and we need to think about change because you know, honestly, uh, and this is a, I don't want to go off too off tangent here, but mid nineteen uh, twenties Germany was the most progressive, the most cultural, the you know, among the best, you know, most modern place on the planet 10 years later it was the worst the most mm -hmm. regressive place on the planet change is really funny it can happen incredibly quickly both on the negative side and on the positive side and we have to be vigilant about that we have to understand that we are honestly right now in a place of a nexus where change is coming we know this right change is coming and so we we have to be very mindful of how we're going to shape this change and I think that we have this great potential uh, that Justine's talking about in her book about this pivot into a new way of being and living and thriving. But at the same time, we do have these re regressive forces that are constantly acting to try to shape it the other direction. And, I, and so I think we do d need to be mindful that w if we don't pivot in the right way, we're going to pivot some way, right? <laughs> we're going to go in one direction or another because that's where we're at. I don't know, do you guys uh, agree or disagree with that, that we are on, on the thrust of a major transformation of some kind? I think that's right. Uh, uh, one of the things that I thought was really interesting, uh, as we're thinking back politically anyway, looking back to 2012 and when Obama won the second second term, and then after mm -hmm. Obama's, Obama and his whole thing has changed, right? And, um, and a lot of people look back and say, oh, well, where was the change? Where was the change? But in retrospect, it, it it seems pretty obvious to me in retrospect. It was it was the catalyst that brought all of these issues to the fore, right? Because right. Th there was no hiding about the climate anymore. There was no hiding about American racism anymore. There was no hiding about misogyny anymore. All these things came that would been bubbling under the surface for 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 decades, for decades, uh, for, and and have just sort of they came to the surface. And I I agree with you, Joe. I think that we are at an inflection point. To go back to what Justine said earlier at the top of the show, we are at an inflection point, one way or another, right? Yeah. Um, we are at an inflection point. We are at a uh, and in like the we're at the at the beginning of the of a new industrial age. Right. And the question is, what right. does that end up looking like? And um, and that that's why this this topic is so, so relevant. I agree completely that we're in an interregnum. We've had 400 years of colonialism, mm -hmm. slavery, mm. racism, oppression. And interregnum means time between kings, like after mm. the old king died. And the new king hasn't been crowned yet. It doesn't it feel like we're in between something. It and really does. It really does. Is waiting to take the stage. Like, but we don't know what it is yet. And but right. it's really something that we all help like envision and make happen. I mean, it's a creative process. It does feel like something old is dying away and something new is waiting to be reborn. I really yeah. think this this time is special. So it's up to us to figure out well, what do we want? How do we bring how do we envision something and then bring it into it? It is yeah. up to us. Yeah. I think uh, I, I just wanted to say I do believe that because of this interregnum and because 
conservatives know that their old ways are dying and it is it is driving them completely batshit over the edge and this is obama started this right because yes. uh, he he you know he okay first black president right but he's also not just a not just a black guy he's like he's talking about climate change and he is mm. he's he's directly and by the way the power of the bureaucracy even though he wasn't able to get a lot of things done through congress he was able to get a lot done through bureaucracy and his clean power plan and his vehicle mileage standards were the biggest actions that anybody had ever taken uh, on climate change to date. So right. they're seeing all of this happen. They're seeing they're, they're 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 actually seeing what is coming and they're furious about it. And they want to they're, they're trying to do everything they can. And, and they frankly could succeed in destabilizing society so much that we wouldn't be able to have the resources to do this. And that's what they're that's really what the path that they're on. Yeah, I mean, it, just to put it short and sweet, recycling is great, right? <laughs> Think about that kind of stuff like but it's not going to do the job, right? It's not even close. We have to look deeper. We have to be radical, right? And and think about everything that's happened through radical change, right? Uh, civil rights movement, the feminist movement, right? All um, technology itself is just fundamentally radical in, in, in the nature of its change, right? And and so we got to. And, and having said that, what I want to move to now is this concept that you refer to in your book. Uh, which is circular economies. Mm -hmm. I think that's a radical shift. And so I, I really want to focus in on that in particular. Tell us about that, Justine. Um, we, we here on the radical secular love to talk about systemic solution. This is certainly one of those. It's, re it's really a shift from a linear flow of extraction uh, of raw materials, manufacturing, use, and disposal. I mean, here in California, we, we're so proud of our great recycling rate, but it's really only 37% when you look at the whole state. And that nationally, it's 32%. Like 9% oh. of the plastics are being recycled, and everyone's throwing all their plastics into the recycling bin. Meanwhile, like 46% of all the plastics in the Pacific Ocean and the gyre between Hawaii and, and California are abandoned fishing nets, nylon six fishing nets. And so, I'm just interested in what are the pilots? What, where if somebody tried a solution and it's worked? Right. So Aquafil is this Italian company that's working with volunteer scuba divers to go collect those nylon six fishing nets. And then they pay the fishermen to cut off parts of the nets, fold them up and put them in thousand pound bags. And then they're shipped to Slovenia where they're recycled into new swimsuits, socks, new carpeting. Hmm. I mean, we could be reclaiming more of these plastics and turning them into new products. We've been just relying way too long on let's just ship it to China and, you know, see what happens. Well, it turns out China wasn't recycling all the plastics anyway. And now that China's refusing them, Malaysia and Indonesia, Argentina are saying, we'll take them, but they don't really have the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. yeah. We need to do a better job of like making things last longer. Shirts should last more yep. than three uses. You should be wearing right. a shirt for five <laughs> or 10 years, right? Um, how do we buy things that last? How can we make sure we can repair them? Having tool lending libraries, repair cafes and maker spaces. How do we reuse things as much as possible? and then upcycle them when they outlive their, their useful life. That's the circular economy we'd like to get. That is really, really fascinating. Um, uh, two things come to mind right away. First of all, I'm thinking, um, Deep Space Nine and the idea of the very first episode, I think, is the 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 uh, the introduction of the wormhole aliens who do not live a linear existence, right? Yeah. And we as we as human beings live a linear existence, so we tend to think about things that way, right? So we are born, things have a, have a, a birth, and they have a death, and then they're disposed of. And I think that that we tend to think about things that way naturally, um, but we need to start thinking about things um, uh, in a circular way, in a in, in a truly um, in a in, in a truly uh, recycling sort of way, um, reusable way. Um, and, and in terms of recycling, that's another thing about the human psyche, right? This idea that it makes people feel good that, oh, I, I separated right. my, I, I separated my, uh, my plastics, right? I'm good. I'm good. I, I did my part for the world. Oh, and by the way, I buy, uh, I'm, I, don't, I don't drive a gas, a gas guzzler, so I'm good, right? I mean, that's it. That's all we got to do. Um, <laughs> But again, we have to think radically about this, right? Um, and the biggest ob obstacle here is, right, you, I think on one hand, you have people who don't fully grasp the concept and why I think having your book, Justine, and the 
these conversations are so important to educate people from that on that stuff. And then you have the folks that do understand this, but are just making money off the way things are now, right? And so that is like the biggest sort of financial obstacle. But like you said, Justine, thinking about this stuff radically, um, uh, going with the early adopters, I love that optimism because uh, I am an Obama Democrat, as I call myself. And I mean, I am optimistic. Um, it gives me goosebumps, frankly, to think about um, how it, of, of building that sort of a coalition and frankly, overwhelming the over overwhelming the detractors, because that's all that there's no persuading it will take overwhelming. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, <clears throat> as you mentioned, Justine, I think, you know, there's problems with our recycling. China's not taking it anymore. Um, a lot of cities that used to just ship their stuff over to China are just landfilling their recycling at this point. Um, and so I, I often wonder if in the future we might be able to mine landfills for raw materials. I don't know if that's something that that is that is possible or if the stuff is too degraded by the time you get to it. But I think beyond that, recycling is dealing with um, a problem downstream. And what we really need to do to build the circular economy is uh, start with product design. So right. that products, they're designed with the, with the materials that are, are, are used um, instead of having to separate things, you know, like you've got, a, you've got a drink container that's got paper and plastic all laminated together, can't be separated, can't be recycled. You know, all that, that's a bad design and we need to get rid of those kind of designs. And we also start ne needing to think uh, of, we need to start thinking of waste as a technical nutrient to another, an input to another process that was in the upcycle book. And it, it becomes a source of value right now. Trash is an output that costs us money to dispose of. And if we make it a, into a valuable input, then you know we're way ahead of the game because it's cheaper often to use brand new materials than it is to separate recycling with current processes. And it, it's a profound change of paradigm. If we can somehow manage to bring those costs, that uh, uh, the, the, the costs of recycling into the price of the product so that that money can then be put into true recycling programs, I think you know, it's, it's, it's design, it's the economy, it's, it's so many areas that need to work together to make this happen. Yeah. And we have a great model, by the way, we have a wonderful model, nature itself, right? Which is circular, right? Everything is, is based on cycles. Nothing is wasted for the most part, right? Mm -hmm. We have to think about, and this, this linear thinking about if the economy really started with it, the advent of the industrial revolution. More than you know, because before that, you know, tra traditional people understood the cycles of nature and work with them. They had no choice but to do that, right? Uh, and then as we as we moved into the sort of the industrial era, we began to do things more and more linearly, right? And now, and now we have a world that's, that has an economy which is ninety eight percent based on linear processes, and it's just killing us. It's killing this planet. And we've got to we've got to change. Well, we don't need government to do everything, but there's a few key things we do need government to do. And France just par just passed a repairability index where the company wow. <coughs> sorry, I'm coughing off. The companies that make consumer products, appliances, electronics have to put have to create a number that goes on their products saying how repairable it is. <coughs> and it the there are five elements to it, like how easy is it to repair, how um, can you get spare parts, these kinds of things. And so in that same article that I was reading about this, one guy took an iPhone to a Swiss watch repair place and had him look at it. <laughs> and he asked him, you know, what do you think of this iPhone? Is this repairable? And the, the Swiss watchmaker said, this is glued together. This is just lazy. You should be able to take it apart and pull pieces out and put new pieces in. I mean, Swiss watches that are, you pay $10,000 for have all these little parts. They don't glue it together. They make it repairable. So we could be doing more of that, designing for recycling with our products. Mm. Um, there's also an opportunity, like I, I tell the story about the thrift store in Lane County, Oregon, where they hired a full-time fashion designer to take a look at this like river of donations that people were making and sorting through them and figuring out what can I upcycle? And so because she was down the street from the University of Oregon, she noticed a lot of flannel shirts coming in on the donation pile and a lot of hoodie sweatshirts. <laughs> she started cutting off the sleeves for both and sewing the flannel sleeve on the hoodie sweatshirt, put right. on a bunch of them. As soon as the University of Oregon students found out about it, those sold out. She made another batch. They sold out. Um, she would see leather couches come in that were ripped and stained, and she'd cut them apart and sew them into tote bags. 
And so she took their average daily sales from $500 a day to $1,500 a day, which gave St. Vincent de Paul, which is the, which is the social safety net for that county, an extra $300,000 a year with which to help people. Wow. Wow. Her labor. <clears throat> Wouldn't it be great if we could have recent fashion graduates spend six months or a year in a thrift store just trying to upcycle things into new products that would be exciting and creative that people would want to buy? I just wanted to give a whole bunch of examples so people could think which one they're interested in, which one they want to make happen in their community so we can replicate this. And this is where I want to plug your book, Justine, because there's lots of great examples in your book. So, so buy Justine's book. It's awesome. Yeah. Well, one thing that just, just to, to, to <laughs> think about, th- you're talking about making unique, one-of-a-kind products. And everything is so mass-produced. People love bespoke type of items. And mm-hmm. when that comes from, if they think they can go to a thrift store and get something that nobody else has, that, that could be an amazing right. um, opportunity. That's a great point, uh, Sean. I, I wonder too, if there is like uh, the, the flannel shirts, was there, uh, you know, hoppy beer shirts? Like, like I've, I, in my mind, right? If you're University of Oregon folks are drinking hoppy, hoppy, hoppy beer, probably smoking a lot of weed and definitely wearing flannel shirts. All of which I sounds like a lot of fun to me, but it's still also it worth, is. it's also worth poking fun a little <laughs> bit at the, at the hipsters up there. Um, but, it, you know, as, as we're talking, it sounds like, uh, these ideas, you have to incentivize people to do them, right? Mm-hmm. And so when you are, when you create, and, and there's a supply and demand factor here, right? And 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 so putting together what you're saying, Sean, this sort of coolness of a, of a bespoke product and linking that up with a good idea of, 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 of reusing stuff. I mean, this is, these are the kind of ideas that I think you, that can help drive drive right because it becomes cool then to get that right and that and, th- and then that then that that then you have a um you have a, a a motive for people to show up and 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 sort of and and create demand for this so anyway great ideas i'm looking forward to looking at more in the book for sure yeah and of course we're talking about consumerism primarily but we can also uh, apply the same principle of circular economy to industrial processes right mm-hmm. one c- corporation's waste products is another corporation's natural resource, right? And so nothing's ever wasted that way. And that can be very easily done. I know Germany has is, is, is come a long way into doing some, some of these things. But we can't spend too much time on it because we have so much more to talk about. And I want to switch to um, food systems, right? Mm. There's so much to, that can be said about that. Uh, tell us about what you think we should be doing with food. I have a sneaking suspicion you're going to talk, talk us into being vegetarian. But uh, here's another example of where we can think about using resources. Can you, and and coming up with local solutions. What, I mean, what can communities do, for example? Well, I'd love to see more. I mean, we're talking about technology. We do need apps where people can say, uh, okay, I'm in San Francisco. I just had an event. I've got 20 trays of extra food. Can someone come pick it up? which is great that there's that app, but you still need somebody to drive over and pick it up and take it to the homeless shelter. So there, there's so many opportunities to, to take surplus prepared food and, and send it to people who can use it. Mm-hmm. But at a more fundamental level, we need smaller scale regional agriculture. I mean, mm-hmm. these, these large monocrops where they're spraying pesticides and herbicides is, is destroying the bottom layer of the food web. I mean, the insects. I'm, I'm doing my climate ride next month for Western monarch butterflies. So, you, so in the 1980s, there were 4.5 million Western monarchs that migrate from the base, from the foothills of the Sierra Nevada to the coast. Um, 4.5 million, right, in the 1980s. In December of this past year, the Xerxes Society counted, do you want to guess how many Western monarchs? I don't even want to know. Uh, it's going to be you so depressing. <clears throat> it's so depressing. It, it's 2000. So oh, oh, my, oh. the number's oh. down 99.95%. And that's partly the wildfires, partly climate change, partly wow. the but we can do, we can turn this around. I mean, we are the stewards of this planet. We're the ones who can stop spraying neonic, pesticides and my money for my client ride is going to the river partners uh, nonprofit and they're planting eight different monarch rest stops along one of the rivers that runs along their migration route because when they're flying when they're migrating butterflies fly near rivers 
And so they need rest stops where they can get some food and water and shade and you know, lay their eggs. And so there are solutions. We just need to do them. We need to find the resources. Find the resources, make it happen. Um, yeah, it's... Uh, yeah. It, we keep coming back to this problem that there is, uh, for whatever reason, the incentive structure is that making a ton of stuff, like conglomerate, uh, sort of huge corporations merging with each other, making a ton of stuff, right? Because the goal of your corporation is 100% market share, right? That is every corporation's ultimate drive, but that is the natural force of a corporation, right? So, um, and and so you try to do that as well, as so you, the way you do that is merge. And so you get these gigantic sort of, um, these gigantic companies that do the, like you say, these mono crops and the, and then to, then you have to transport them, right? And so then you have to spray them with the pesticides and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, I'm just, um, how, I'm just thinking, I don't think that anyone needs to have an answer to this right now, but sort of the problem that comes to my mind right away is like, do we have the government? How do you do this, right? How do you get the government? Because the only, only organization that's strong enough to force companies to stay small and regional is government, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and, or you have to create some other sort of incentive. In other words, it's easy to that. You can either use the government to force people or you can create a private incentive somehow. And I wonder what that private incentive might be. <clears throat> well, it's a really good point. A lot, a lot of the thinking when I was preparing the book was around, I mean, what is the private sector really good at doing? Mm -hmm. they, they can unleash a lot of resources and get things done efficiently and quickly. What is the nonprofit sector really good at? They are people focused on mission and goals, and they work in a lean way. And then what do we need government to do? What is not going to happen unless government does it? And I really came up with three things, set goals where the state of California said, okay, we're gonna reduce our greenhouse gas emissions 40% below 1990 levels by 2030. We also need government to, um, at the city level, develop ordinances. Like if you're gonna tear down old Victorian houses in Portland that were built before 1916, and you're throwing away solid oak wood flooring, wood banisters, mm, um, mm. wood framing is half the value of, a, of an old house. Um, cloth with tubs, porcelain sinks, you, you have to salvage it instead. And here's $2,500 of grants for the first year. For each so government, we need to set goals, develop ordinances, and most importantly, I have an economics background, so do forgive me, address <laughs> negative externalities. If yes. someone's doing something that's pushing a cost off onto somebody else, you didn't ask to bear that cost, my best friend's son has asthma. He didn't ask to have worse asthma attacks when the air quality is bad. Mm. And yet he suffers from us burning fossil fuels when he has asthma attack. It's government's job to take that situation where negative externality is being pushed off into someone else, levy a fee on it, and you disperse those revenues to pay to fix it, to do the more system. So that's what we need government to do. And then the, the private financial sector has a role to play too. They've raised trillions of dollars for climate solutions. They want to be able to invest. We just need to get the projects ready for them. Mm. Yeah, and I wanted to mention something about there's a, there's a sort of a nexus between uh, externalities and uh, personal preference. I want to talk a little bit about the curmudgeons. And uh, you know, you, just a few minutes ago, we were talking about food and and mm -hmm. food uh, waste and all that. And I have to talk about what it's going to take to give to get people to give up the taste of meat because that's a big <laughs> impediment to solving the climate crisis. And it's also a big political identity position in many parts of the US. Conservatives and especially conservative men take extreme pride in eating meat and grilling that whole culture. And so if if you deal with the externalities of, of meat production, that, that's going to raise prices. They're going to scream and holler about that. And they're going to attack politically you know, anyone who is trying to solve that problem. And some of the people who are trying to solve, there's been a meteoric rise in the last few years of plant-based meats that are really good. They're, they, it's a whole different world from the kind of, you know, meat substitutes that used to be around when I was growing up. And, you know, we, we might get in the next five years, things like lab-grown steaks that are almost as indistinguishable from the real thing. And, um, you know, but there's this there's this problem with libertarians and Republicans and 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 men specifically who are really upset about 
how people are trying to tell them what to eat. I, I, I read recently a really bad, bad sci-fi dystopian book by a conservative author, and he spends at least 20% of the book complaining about the horrible future of food and how it's all going to be bland and tasteless and everyone's going to be forced to eat kale and process bugs. <laughs> and, you know, it's just this morbid fear among conservatives that someone's going to tell them how to eat. So I, I don't know what to do about that part. <laughs> have you tried Beyond Meat or Impossible Burgers? Oh, yeah. I, I have, eat yeah. them all the time. I love all the them. time. Yeah. yeah, I think they're great. I think they're great. But of course, you know, my mind, my prop, my, uh, I'm open minded to that, right? So I'm, I'm coming into it wanting it to taste good, not wanting it to taste bad, right? So, it, so it's like it, it's a, it's it confirms what I already want it to sort of taste like. But it, I think it's great. I, I can't tell the difference between a a burger. I went to to Burger King specifically to get their Impossible Whop Whopper. Yeah, uh, I hadn't, I haven't had it because I haven't had a Whopper in years, and I had, and so I had, it and I was like. This tastes like the Whopper I know. Like, yeah. I mean, it, it absolutely it's, does. We don't eat. We don't buy ground beef anymore. We just buy Impossible Burger, you know, uh, meat and 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 make the burgers. We make them just like normal with a, with a patty and everything. Grill them. And they they taste great. And um, yeah, I I. But there's a lot of conservatives who will just say, "You'll never get me to eat that shit." Mm -hmm. You know, it's just That's like right. overwhelm meat at every meal, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and I took them for Impossible Burgers. At, um, got to roadside recently. And these are great. <laughs> yeah, they are good. They really objectively are good. Let's move on to a more philosophical question. What I want to talk about, and you mentioned this a lot in your book, what does human flourishing look like? What does it mean to thrive? And I know uh, you place a great emphasis on meaningful job. That's one thing we already talked about. We talk about that, uh, about that a little bit more, but what about what does it what does it mean to have meaningful communities? We are social beings, after all. What's it mean to have meaningful communities? I think people are hungry, especially after being locked up for a year with the pandemic. Mm -hmm. People are hungry to connect with people. Zoom is wonderful that I can like chat with friends in Europe or on the East Coast without getting in a plane, but we're also missing something too, and so. Just would love to see people not try to fill the, the emptiness in their soul with shopping and mm -hmm. stuff. I mean, we all need a certain minimum level of, of things, but like not continuing to hoard things to buy more stuff for the sake of buying it and rather fill that emptiness with, with community and art and music and spending time with friends in the park and because how much do we really need anyway? I mean, we need a roof over our, over our heads. We need some cool T-shirts to wear. We need some food. Um, we need access to health care. But at the end of the day, do we need 10,000 square foot mansions? Do we need seven <laughs> sports cars? Do we need to be flying once a month to an international destination? What do yeah. we really need? What yeah. really makes us happy? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's funny. Uh, I lived in... Um, the wilds of the Andes mountains for about a year. And when I was living the, with these villages, we had nothing compared to American lifestyle. I mean, literally, you know, you couldn't even find floss, right? If you found <laughs> floss, you had to go into the city and maybe, maybe you got, you got some crappy floss. right? And then, <laughs> and then, you know, at one point, this little girl stole our floss in the village. We had no floss from us <laughs> right? or toilet paper, man, you know, like, the, the worst toilet paper in the world, you know? And then I, I came back to the United States and I had such a culture shock. I would walk into like CVS and there'd be a whole wall of floss, right? 25,000 different kinds of toilet paper, right? It was really a, a, like, after living like that, it was a real culture shock. You know, like my wife was pregnant, came back, we uh, expecting a baby and we needed to deal with that. And now in Argentina where we lived, you know, a woman and her baby, what you what what did you need? You needed a shawl that you could use in all different ways, and that was it, basically. And that, <laughs> that, and that was the only accessory that most women at in that village used. We get a big here, we need a diaper genie, we need a, a three different kinds of cribs, we need like dozens and dozens of must items in order to have a baby, right? It was such it was so it, I did not expect to feel so traumatized by that and i really did because i realized at, at that point i was i was an act advocate of, for the for the environment at that point and i just realized how fucked up our society has really become in terms of this just unnecessary con consumerism 
Yeah, I, d- trauma that that is really interesting, Joe. And uh, I, we, I think we got a little bit of a taste of that talking to Ade last week and over yeah. the last over the last month, uh, back and forth with Ade, and just like holy crap, like right, you know what we are used to here in the United States, but but in particular the consumerism I wanted to talk about, and um, you know we, my wife and I, we walk and the and the community, right? My wife and I, uh, because of the pandemic, just like everybody else, we are home all the time, and da da da. And we are those of us who are fortunate to be able to be home all the time. Let me qualify that. But we also go for walks a lot. And mm-hmm. since now, now that it's warm out, we really are like, wow, we live in Jersey City, New Jersey. And we're like, man, you know, when you move to the suburbs, you lose this sense of community, right? We walk around right. and there are people right here, right? And I know my neighbors, they live right over there. And there's parks with a lot of people playing and most people are walking places, biking places. And when you go and, and so you, this, and there's real value to that because when there you is. go, when you go out to the suburbs and everyone's in their little box car driving from one place to another, and you lose that. And the only way, by the way, you get that community is through through perhaps like if you put your kids into soccer and you have your friends with the other soccer moms and then, but then again, now you are in a similar economic, social economic class, right? So you are not connecting with people like we right. connect with people of all, we live in Jersey city. I mean, there's like millionaires here and there's people who are immigrants and there are day laborers here too, right? Like it's the whole gamut in our neighborhood, right? So, right. Um, and there's something really valuable about that. And, and, uh, and then it gives us a sense of community. And I, and I was reminded of that because of the pandemic and not being able to connect with people, plus the fact that it's spring and we were in, inside all winter long. I'm like, oh, that's right. This is why we live here. There's yeah. real value to this, you know? This is really an important point that you're bringing up, Christoph. And and I think that, you know, when you look at all of the refinements for urban areas that are possible with green, you know, redesign of cities, okay, a, a more sustainable society is already a much more meaningful one. And, and we, yes. we tend to un- underestimate this level of trauma that our current capitalist society produces, all the things you mentioned. It's not a byproduct. This is by design, okay? People know the system hates them right now, and they hate the system in return. And all this fear of, of job loss, loss of one's home, not having health care, being deep in debt with student loans, it all forces people to confront these traumatic realities. That, and, and then they're forced into awful choices to take unfulfilling, low-paying jobs. It's, it's really, this all comes together. Everything we're talking about comes together in our cities. And so people, they're, all their time is consumed. They're, they're, they're suffering abuse and neglect at these jobs. They, they have little time to themselves to develop their skills. They feel like they have no purpose. So it leads to domestic abuse, addiction, general rage, heartbreak. And it, and it goes beyond even that. Everybody knows nature is dying, whether mm-hmm. they want to admit it or not. People see it. The world, it's already radically different from the way it was when I was growing up. And I feel the sense of mourning basically all the time. It, it's a low-level fear for the future and grief that never goes away. So getting rid of that would lift this huge burden from everyone. Having a sense of hope that we're going to be able to build a future that's better than the past instead of resigning ourselves to the to a dystopia. I mean, it, that would be priceless. Think about how we're programmed even by Hollywood to expect that the future is going to be a disaster. Some of our best films, you know, Blade Runner, e- everything, it's always an ecological disaster, okay? It's and true. changing those expectations would immediately improve people's mental health and of course the social aspect, denser communities allow for natural shared activities like co-housing, community kitchens, gardens, other amenities. Giving people a real stake in their communities means that they will take care of their communities and you know do away with what you you mentioned about these that you know being people being in gated communities and boxes and 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 just locked away uh, in their single family homes. It's destructive because you know it, it it's it's you're creating a structural physical structural class. And if mm. people were more living together with with people of different racial uh, and class backgrounds, then they would begin to see each other as neighbors and fellow citizens. Yep, absolutely. Uh, you know, I as an educator, I, I I used to teach climate change courses. I don't know at the moment, but when I prepared for those courses, of course, it was just heartbreaking to read to read the research on climate change because you see, you know, just how staggering the problem is. And I learned as a teacher, I learned that I had to be careful of how I presented this information because it really could depress people to the point of apathy and nihilism, mm. right? And, uh, and again, I mean, it's really important to, to be honest about what's happening, but at the same time also say, but we can do better. We can get past this, right? We have the means and the ability. We just need the will 
to, to be able to, to make changes that will take us to a much better place. And I think that's a critically important message. And again, your book has that message. So that's, that's what's really important about it to me. Uh, but the question does arise, though, and it has to be answered. Can we heal this great damage that we've caused to the biosphere? Is it possible? Right? I mean, that's a question I, you have to pose. This is why I come at it about job with jobs, because mm -hmm. you can't, conservatives can't argue with, we want to create jobs so that people have income to support themselves. Mm -hmm. And we'd be doing this kind of work. Because the alternative is, I mean, just letting the marketplace create the jobs it wants to has brought us hundreds of thousands of additional soul-crushing Amazon warehouse worker jobs and DoorDash delivery people. I mean, that's, that's right. what the marketplace has to offer us. And right. <laughs> my 19-year-old son who was came back from college and uh, said, so I'm thinking of getting a part-time job. I'm like, well, Amazon's hiring. They keep texting me. <laughs> no way. <laughs> like, I don't want to pee in a bottle. How awful those jobs are. <laughs> but that's what the yeah. marketplace is creating. We need to be more intentional. What kinds of what kind of future do we envision? And I'd love to see more science fiction, like do some utopian as opposed to dystopian. I don't know if anybody would want to read it, but <laughs> envisioning of the future and then what kinds of jobs. And so the, the financial community, I, I interviewed Jigger Shaw, who was the, the president of Generate Capital here in San Francisco. Um, they do project finance and, and they invested $5 million in solar microgrid in the Salinas School District at six K through 12 schools. And he said, just seeing we've raised a trillion dollars for climate solutions, but we've only deployed 300 billion of it. There aren't enough requests for proposals out there. Wow. There aren't enough wow. projects. He's like, we're sitting on piles of cash ready to invest it. Help us do this. <laughs> That's amazing. There's money. There are people who want these jobs. Like when, when this recycling position came open for Alameda County to help the 10,000 workers do a better job recycling, 400 people applied for it and 399 didn't get it. Like people want to do this work. There's money out there. We know that we can't have three degrees of global average increase in temperature on this planet. If we get to five or six, like that's the end of civilization completely. Most people have no idea. Yeah. And we're heading towards 1.5 degrees at this point. So like we know what the problems are. Lots of people want to do this work. We have the money. Somebody just has to connect these dots and put it all together and make it happen. And some of these jobs can happen at the local level. Some we need the state government. Biden's infrastructure bill has climate woven all through it. So Yeah, it's uh it's it's you know, it's hopeful, right? Uh we talked about Star Trek at the top of the show. We talk about Star Trek like every single show. Um but that's <laughs> because but <laughs> but that's because um because it's hopeful. It is science fiction focused on the future, focused on that bright uh, sort of uh, perspective that's not dystopian, right? And again, this sort of stuff gives me goosebumps, right? And 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 I'm fascinated, and I'm I was interested to hear that you have an economics background because all of this stuff is it's just and and the Green New Deal and the Thrive Act, which we're going to talk about, it really it it highlights and and the infrastructure bill as well highlights how you can't really parse these things out. They are all, and justice, right? And social justice, you can't parse these topics out. They are one and the same, and we have yep. to act boldly together in this way. And I'm just so glad that people are like AOC, folks like you uh, are willing to say, like, just call the call the bullshit out for what it is and say, look, this is what we need to do. We cannot piss pussyfoot around this anymore. Here is what it is, you know? And uh, it's, it's hopeful, it's hopeful. Well, I wanted to mention because you talked about having utopian sci-fi and there is actually a good nonfiction book called Utopia for Realists by Rutger Bregman. Ah, yes. I don't I don't know if you've ever heard of that book, Justine, but it's really great. It's um it talks about all kinds of strategies. It's kind of the antidote to bullshit jobs, right? Because mm -hmm. you have people with, you know, working 15 hours a week, right? And getting and having enough money to live. And that is actually what John Maynard Keynes predicted almost 100 right. years ago would be he happening did. by now, that people would be able to, to, to survive working 15 hours a week 
or less even and because because we know that industrial civilization can produce more than enough goods and services uh, without people having to having to just be attached to these bullshit jobs. So it's that is to me, I, I try to get everybody I can to read Utopia for Realists. Well, let's move on here. One of the things you talk about in The Great Pivot is to have good solutions, we need to understand what is happening. And we need to better ways of measuring and assessing what is happening. And so what's wrong with the way we're doing it now? Hey, GDP for the gold, right? Ah. <laughs> What do you think, Justine? Yeah, Tell GDP us. is such a problem. I mean, GDP was a great measurement back in the Depression when they were trying to figure out how many jobs were being created and if it was pulling us out of the Depression. But now it's just so inadequate. I mean, GDP is just a measure of money changing hands. And so when there's a car accident and someone needs six surgeries to like reconstruct their leg, that adds to the GDP. When there's an oil spill off the coast of Alaska that adds to GDP because there's somebody has to clean it up. So let's have more of those. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> like what what I mean, what's what are the really useful metrics that, that we want to use? And so that's why I'm so grateful to to Kate Rayworth, who wrote Donut Economics, talks about we need to I mean she looks at all the the basic tenets of of neoliberalism, economics, and, and says, you know, negative externalities aren't really accounted for. And, you know, we're, we need to overlay some kind of ethics and morality here. We're, we're overshooting the, the planet's capacity to support life. And we're under providing, you know, basics for people. Everyone deserves to have food and shelter and access to a doctor and internet now. In the United States, if you know, internet, you can't apply for a job. So if we're going to get to the safe space between overshoot and under provision of basics, then that's, that's really what we need to be putting capitalism and economics in service of. You, what, when you said, Justine, you talked about a couple of things that I thought was really interesting. First of all, neoliberalism and, and GDP seem to me are just so linked, right? Because it's all about growth, 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 growth. And it's all about, like you said, money changing hands and, in, 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 and also an increasingly sort of financialized economy, right? Uh, money changing hands really doesn't does not mean value, right? That does not mean good. That does not mean good things for people. It just means some people are making a lot of money and the economy may be growing but again allocation is what is what uh seems to me matters the most oh you know what this goes back to your point where you said about the inflection point that we're at like that sort of uh the in the, the uh, i don't remember the term you use interregnum um regum interregnum um, yeah interregnum um and uh because it seems to me and there's a lot of articles about this coming out and even conservatives trump supporters and everything like that right they don't like neoliberalism like they may not know what neoliberalism is but if you actually talk about those strategies for making money trickle down economics etc 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 these ideas are no one likes these ideas right these are these are and so it's getting to the point where it seems like the 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 thatcher reagan sort of um love affair that that the world has had with those ideas is sort of souring and um and this is where ideas like the new green deal and the things that you're talking about can step into the void so i think that's um, it's interesting it's interesting it sounds like an interregnum before the pandemic even started but then the pandemic covid broke healthcare it broke public mm -hmm. transit it broke where people go to work it broke where yeah. kids go to school it broke our commercial food supply chain. I mean, all of a sudden, one out of four Americans were food insecure. And all these farmers who were growing potatoes for McDonald's and, you know, onions and broccoli and, and all this food and, and dairy were like dumping. They were yeah. dumping things because they, nobody was buying the hotels closed last March, the restaurants closed, the schools closed. And like COVID broke so many things that it just accelerated the pace of wealth inequality and people not having a, I mean, for goodness sake, during a pandemic, help, because healthcare is tied to people's jobs and tens of millions of people all of a sudden lost their jobs and then lost their healthcare. Like how in a wealthy nation that we're in could we possibly justify that I just think it made a stronger case for universal health care. Sure. Yeah. Really yeah. Sped up the interregnum. Well, for sure. And, you know, also, uh, I want to talk about the fact what you said about conservatives and neoliberalism, because 
they, I mean, conservatives always want to talk about free markets and, and all this kind of stuff. And they just, they've heard it so many times, but they don't like neoliberalism. When, when they, when they, when they hear about neoliberalism, what they say is the, the system is rigged. They don't know the word for it, but they know the system is rigged. Yes, exactly. And they, a lot of libertarians also talk about cronyism, and that's also what they're talking about, is that right. the system is rigged. And so that's that's a big problem. And it just <clears throat> getting the terms of the debate <laughs> to where liberals and conservatives can talk about the system being rigged in the same way would, would go would go a long way towards point. solving Great the problem. Great point. And, yeah, and, and, and I also want to talk about uh, inequality as something that is so huge because GDP does not measure it. You need the Gini coefficient, right? And America's Gini coefficient has just been going, it's just been going up and up and up and up. And, uh, we already were one of the, among the highest in the world, but the pandemic, I don't even know what the number is now. It's just, <laughs> do you know, Justine? I haven't been tracking it. I know what you mean, Maria. Yeah. So it's just, it's just going up and up and up. I mean, the, the billionaires got a trillion dollars richer in just in the last year, a lot of that from government funds that are borrowed. So it's just like, it's a horrendous situation. And um, so I, I think that we really have to look at allocation. And uh, interestingly enough, all of the things we need to do for the Green New Deal it helps with inequality as well. So that's really yeah. important. That, if I might just jump in sure, on that, sure, like that ahead. is, that is so important. And it is learning to find a way to have the communication between conservatives, because right, because conservatives uh, who are not who are at the bottom of bottom rungs and in the middle rungs or whatever are are they sense that everyone senses that the system is just not working, right? Everybody senses that it, it, there there is consensus about that, but yeah. there is but there but the language we use to talk about these things is completely different. And there's also and this is the big boogeyman in the or the elephant in the room. And then that there's an entire media apparatus that's dedicated to muddying the waters, right? right. And the, the dedicated like this is what they get up to do every single day is spread it, it is 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 confuse people about what's actually going on out there and what's causing their problems in their lives this is what the and that is we are not as good as messaging on the left and that mm -hmm. is what we have to do we have to find a better way to message and a lot Absolutely. of that is that the way we talk about things we talk about things cerebrally we need to find a way to talk about things in a way that hits the gut and i think interestingly justine the jobs issue is something that we can all get around. That's why talking about things in terms of jobs is something like you said, conservatives can't poo poo that, right? <sighs> They're all about jobs. Everyone's about jobs, right? Right. Well, um, John, you mentioned uh, the inequality index. There's a few of them. And, and there, a lot of them are showing that we've actually su superseded the, the robber baron age. Mm -hmm. that there's wow. more inequality now that than there, there was in, you know, in the 19 teens. And, wow. And, uh, yeah. But anyway, let's go ahead and turn to politics at this point. All right? Let's talk about the Transitional Housing for Recovery and Viable Environment Demonstration Program Act, or THRIVES for short. The THRIVE Act will be introduced this month, and the lead sponsors are Senator Ed Markey, Jeff Merkley, and many representatives, uh, Debbie Dingell, uh, Ilian Omar, Jamal Bowman, and many, many others uh, that are Look, seeing this is really like putting the, the Green New Deal into practice in a way. It's still, I think it's just, it's not, it's a non-binding uh, resolution, isn't it? But it's still, it's giving specifics, right? And so let's talk about it. Um, maybe we should talk about the Green New Deal first, just a little bit. It was, in, you know, just because maybe some people aren't aware of what that was, but it was introduced by uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez of New York, and Senator Edward uh, Markey of Massachusetts, and it calls on the federal government to wean the United States from fossil fuels, firstly. But it also guarantees new high paying jobs in clean energy industries while we do it. And it, what's really controversial about it is, well, let me read from, from the, um, the resolution, HRES 109. Uh, whereas, and that's just legalese, by the way, you guys, uh, Christoph like to use that word, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we like anywhere we can, anything that can make us feel, um, superior to others, uh, right. it, it, <laughs> like medical doctors, you know, yeah, oh, right, right, you right. have, uh, encephalitis, <laughs> magnesium. Oh, I do. Oh, oh. oh anyway. yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, whereas climate change, pollution and environmental destruction have exacerbated 
systemic, racial, regional, social, environmental, and economic injustices, uh, referred to in this preamble as systemic injustices, by disproportionately affecting indigenous people, communities of color, migrant communities, deindustrialized communities, uh, depopulated rural communities, the poor, low-income workers, women, the elderly, the unhoused people with disabilities, and youth referred to in this preamble as frontline and vulnerable communities. This is what the Green, Green New Deal also tackles, where it tries to address this economic and social injustice in our society. And this is just hammers at the impulse on the right to suppress social justice movement to begin with. And they've just, you know, they've just attached themselves to the Green New Deal in that absolutely negative light and trying to paint it as this great threat to Western civilization because, it, you know, of this anti-social justice uh, sort of agenda that we're seeing. So what do we do about that? Uh, some people, Some people argue that maybe we shouldn't, include social justice language from economic and environmental policy. Um, but what do you think? What should we be thinking about here? Well, think about the frontline communities. If, if you and your partner are making minimum wage, you're not going to have a whole lot of money to buy a $3 million house in a nice, pristine, rural, you know, suburban area. You're going to, you're going to have to, you're going to rent probably near an oil refinery or right. where a bunch of highways come together or near the airport or near the port or near an agricultural field where they're spraying pesticides and herbicides near a landfill. I mean, that's where the cheaper real estate is. And you're probably going to be renting, not buying. And so by, by making a transition, a just transition to a cleaner economy based on renewable energy and electric vehicles and bicycles and sustainable agriculture, you're going to relieve these communities of this burden of pollution that they didn't ask to to bear, but that they have to because they don't have any other choice of where they live. And, and so it's not a small burden, right? Issues, it's, it's closely tied in, the justice issues with the environmental issues. And that's really the framework for the Green New Deal and the Thrive Act. Yeah, I, that's, I think that's, that's, a great point. And uh, it sort of connects to what we were talking about a little bit earlier, which is that we really can't parse out these issues, the economic, the environmental and the social justice issues. They are the same issues um, and they and they just so impact one another. And people don't like to think in systems. Uh, conservatives certainly don't like to think in sim sy systems or 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 uh, or frankly, outcomes. Um, right. They think about they think about things a little bit differently. Um, but what I also was struck by by why by what you and Joe were saying is that these ideas are wildly popular. Like nothing in there, if they were just listed, right? Conservatives and like if Donald Trump said that, if you if Donald Trump would say that and put it put out a press release and send it to the conservatives, conservatives say, oh wow, these are great ideas, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. They definitely would. They absolutely would. But again, this is about muddying the waters. And so what they do instead is they tie AOC to the Green New Deal. And now she becomes a scapegoat, right? So right. It, right, they don't they at the they don't have unity on on their economic message. Their economic message is incredibly unpopular. But what they do have unity on are the social issues. So you attack trans women. Right now you see these trans bills all over the place, right? Because it just ginnies up and consolidates the base. And so, mm -hmm. you know, to to break through to that that group of people I don't think we should shirk away from our values and say like, we, you know, like justice is not part of this, but we need to talk about things in terms of jobs and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and the term infrastructure plan, that term is great because it feels like Burke, like, so like, you know, uh, FDR and and uh, and building and uh, you know, putting people back to work and these sort of concepts and these ideas, if we can on the left use that kind of imagery and those big bold ideas, uh, I think we might be able to break through. And I'm hopeful on that. I really yeah. do because yeah. we're in this inflection point and because economic insecurity and uh, and the uh, split between rich and poor has has been so, like you said, Justine, exacerbated by the uh, by the pandemic, et cetera. Yeah. Well, I want to mention also because Republicans know that they lose. If you, if you wave all these jobs, these new jobs in front of people, you wave in front of them, better roads, better bridges, uh, better internet, all these things, they can't, they really lose if they 
uh, if if they oppose those things, they try to so they, they try to stick on a message of doom and they try to make you think about what you're going to lose. OK, yes. this dreary defeatism. I mean, I I was looking at yesterday. I looked up a clip uh, with Mitch McConnell. He was talking about the Green New Deal in 2019. And he's like, the heart of the Green New Deal is that the government <laughs> gets to tell you what kind of house you live in, what kind of car you can drive and if you can drive it at all. You know, and, and he goes on. He's, he then he exaggerates the cost. He throws around absurd figures like $30 trillion it's going to cost over 10 years. And what he doesn't say is that if we don't do these things, it's going to cost a whole lot more. Not, not just in terms of the damage to the biosphere and all these low-income communities that are in these horrible uh, places, right? But actual real damage to the GDP mm -hmm. in, in reinventing fire. And this is an old story. It goes back, uh, uh, th that book was released in 2005. And Amory Levins talked about $5 trillion in direct savings that he identifies. And now that was that 15 years ago, so that's probably up to $10 trillion if you actually look at the difference between doing things the way of the Green New Deal or a business as usual scenario, right? And so that's not even counting the annual savings in operating costs, okay? Because if you're running power plants without fuel, hello, you're not, you know, you're not buying that. So, you know, and it doesn't count the new jobs that will be created, the ripple effects, and also improved American competitiveness. Mm -hmm. decades into the future because our current economy is extremely wasteful and that waste is really profitable to the to the small handful of extremely wealthy companies and individuals everyone else is paying this huge price in reduced income reduced health reduced standards of living people in charge though uh, of the old industries are, are they're scared and they're they have the money right now okay mitch mcconnell he knows that he's going to lose all these coal mining jobs uh, so he spends all his time fear mongering about this. But in the long run, the Green New Deal would actually benefit Kentucky. I mean, it would really benefit right. Kentucky. And, right, right. you know, but even though it would be better overall in the transition, the winners are different from the losers and the losers are still in power. So that's our problem. Mm. So I'm really glad you brought up coal mining because it's really the canary in the coal mine with the change in, in jobs around. Yeah. It's I interviewed a county commissioner in Western Pennsylvania for the book and in, in the last chapter. And just looking at the Bureau of Labor Statistics numbers, there's only 44,000 coal jobs at this point. They've been automated <laughs> away. And mm. There's less demand for certain types of coal. And it's, it's a really in interesting industry. And, and you understand why the people who are in it want to hold on to it. I mean, this is a place where a guy who graduated high school could be making, didn't go to college, could be making $100,000 to $140,000 a year in West rural Western Pennsylvania. That's enough to buy you a house, have two vacations a year, buy jet skis, a truck, send the kids to college. So I get it why they like it. It's also an, an industry where they'll find a new coal seam and then they'll call all the guys back and say, all right, let's, let's go with this coal seam. And these guys are working six, seven days a week with overtime for months. And then once they finish mining the coal seam, they lay everybody off and say, we'll call you when we find another one. So yeah. you, you can understand how they've been conditioned to just take some time off, wait to be called back. And so when Trump was saying, hey, we're going to bring coal jobs back. Yeah. But the industry's really been in decline since the 1920s when there are 900,000 people working in this industry. It's It's been in decline partly because of automation. I mean, a lot of the jobs have just been automated. So do we really want to try to keep holding on to this or do we want to train them for new opportunities in areas that are growing? I mean, really, financially, coal can't compete with solar and wind anymore. The prices have dropped so much, it just doesn't make sense at any level to keep the coal going. We're subsidizing yeah. it. It's more expensive. It's being automated away. If you look at the uh, the actual data on the, the transformation of coal in the last century, it's staggering. You're absolutely right. It is a great uh, analogy for what's happening. I mean, we went from 900,000 to about, I don't know, something like 80,000 in half a century, while the, the, the actual production of coal quadrupled, right? That's automation. That's the power of automation, right? Mm -hmm. And then we're seeing this across the board. And certainly we're going to be, I think we're going to be doing a show specifically looking at this issue of automation at some point, because I think it's such a critical issue. But, and the other thing I want to mention is think about this. Um, so this, in this pandemic, about 3 million people have died around the world. Let's say it's three times that much. Let's say it's 9 million people have died from this pandemic. That's the number of people who die every year from, from, from pollution every year in the world. Talk about externalities. And it's never mentioned. 
Nobody it's talks about it. Right. Nine million people uh, a year, something like five million people of just air pollution alone mm -hmm. every year around the world die from this. Uh, and, and not to mention all the people that are sickened, which is in the tens of millions and all the communities that are harmed. And it's not just, you know, we can't just think about uh, think about the United States, too. We have to think about how incredibly destructive pollution is to to, you know, developing countries and, and, and the people who live in extreme poverty. It's staggering. And, and we just have essentially just pushed it all aside like it doesn't matter. And this is so this exter externality issue is really up front and center in this discussion. So I'm really so glad you guys have brought it up. Absolutely. Do you think there's any chance we can get rid of subsidies? It seems like a really tough fight to have. But our federal government is subsidizing the oil and gas industry, billions of dollars a year. You know, the monoculture, <laughs> monocrop, pesticide, herbicide kind of agriculture that's conventional. And just subsidizing so many destructive behaviors that, that make it hard for recycling and sustainable agriculture and renewable energy to take off. This might be one of the Can one of the. Get rid of them. I, that's a great question, and this is one of the few points uh, that I and like the Venn diagram between me and a libertarian, and that is right, like is getting rid of government subsidies, right? Like if you like, because you can't prop up dying industries, right? Um, and and that is the sort of hypocrisy uh, on the right that all the time is like, okay, well we we're all pro free market except for these industries that are that are that we benefit from. I I think I really think that it, it becomes. Uh, Sean said earlier, there is the the losers in this game are still in power, right? Um, and therefore, they are fighting tooth and nail, but they are losing, right? They are losing. That is why it's gotten so crazy recently. In the last like 20 years, it's just that they've turned up the craziness to a fever pitch because, I mean, they're kicking and screaming and, and funding these campaigns like the Tea Party and all these sort of campaigns, right? And so... I am optimistic that we are at this place where this is how you get rid of this is how you this is how we get rid of those subsidies is finally overwhelming the folks that are that that stand to lose um, stand to lose. And it's been a process. It's been long. And so like to your point, Joe, so many people have died as a result. It's ecocide. It is it is genocide on an on an abstract level. It is a, it is it is a genocide. And that's not even including climate change disruptions that are coming. That's just right. the pollution. Right. Which is like orders of magnitudes even worse than that. Right, right, right. Anyway, let's bring it back to the Thrives Act. Uh, it's, the, it's proposing, a, something you just mentioned, some of the things that, that are in this, in this act. A public investment of at least $1 trillion for the next physical year. A Thrive Board, representatives coming from impacted communities, from unions, and from indigenous nations. Strong wage and benefit guarantees, access to unions, direct investment to take on injustice, pollution, and joblessness. And at least half of it, which is really cool, is, is focused in frontline communities, the ones I mentioned earlier, um, that have borne the brunt of this systemic racism, environmental injustice, economic exclusion. Uh, and this includes obviously like black communities, indigenous communities, Latinx communities, Arab communities, and so on and so on and so on, all the ones we talked about. So it's, it has this great focus because that's what the people, and as you said, Justine, those are the people who are getting hurt most by this. So the focus should be there. So, uh, Christoph, you make a great point about how, how to package all of this to, to, the, to America. But at the same time, we have to balance it with the reality of like who's really most impacted in negative, negatively by not doing it, right? By continuing mm -hmm. the, the status quo. And um, so once again, we, we have to see this, we have to talk about this very clear intersection between social justice and sustainability and, and all leading to human flourishing. While at the same time, we do need to find ways of packaging this, talking about jobs, talking about infrastructure. And so it's, it, 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 it's a tough balance, but I think we got to try to make it there. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, so the uh, the intersection of social justice and um, and economic justice, I think, is 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 really really critical. And I, I'll be quick about this, but uh, you know, I, I I'm reminded of the Voting Rights, uh, the new Voting Rights Act, um, uh, 
that's that that has been proposed and which is mm-hmm. sitting because of the filibuster sitting around right so but getting what we're seeing in the, this last election which is which has been terrifying for a lot of folks on the right is is that is this new level of participation among people of color among uh, various other marginalized groups indigenous indigenous folks trans folks um, uh, LGBTQ uh, plus folks uh, and so when you connect that with a progressive um, an increasingly progressive young Young, young people, and this coalition is uh, this coalition is it, it can overwhelm the sort of conservative uh, resistance, the curmudgeons, as we talked about mm-hmm. earlier. And but the Voting mm-hmm. Rights Act ends up being critical here, right? Because it, it the, is, because, yeah. it, because otherwise we can't get we can't we have the votes, we have the votes, we just have to get them to the polls, and so yeah. we make that as easy as possible. I just wanted to backtrack a little bit to what you said, uh, Chris, sure. earlier, and that is I, I don't want to, to move on without addressing this point of subsidies, because I think that mm. I, don't, I don't like government subsidies either. And um, but I do think that government subsidies have a role when there are uh, when there are industries that have been, you know, th- that have not been charged for their externalities for a long period of time, like the fossil fuel industry. So, for example, the reason why solar and wind are getting as cheap as they are is because they were subsidized for a while by the government. And mm-hmm. that's helped to bring the balance now to where fossil fuels can't compete without those without subsidies. So now you can take all the subsidies away and renewable energy would do just fine. But it wouldn't have done fine if it hadn't gotten uh, an, a, a number of subsidies and tax credits and things like that for decades, really. There's so, affirmative action analogy there, by the it, way, an affirmative action right, analogy. there, Right. Very, very much so. And so, you know, and then the other thing is to bring the white rural Americans on board. OK, mm-hmm. because if, if they can see that there's something in it for them, it might be able to overwhelm some of the negative messaging from people like Mitch McConnell, because Overall, the problem is, is that it's not a problem. It's good, but it's a problem for them as that they see renewable energy and sustainable systems automatically bringing about improved equality. And they don't like that. They want to be on top on top of the heap. And, you know, people who benefit most from the revitalization of urban communities, things like public transport, walkable cities are on the lower rungs of the economic ladder. We have to get into this whole the whole rural urban divide because the suburbs in the first place were about white flight. We can't forget that. And, and especially the exurbs, right? So the farther out into rural America you get, the whiter it is, and the and the more people who live in rural America don't see these programs benefiting them. They they couldn't care less about public transport or self driving electric cars. They like driving their diesel trucks fifty miles each way into the city. They like living among other white people, and they're not interested in having their taxes raised to pay for urban improvements. So that's the real block, and that's this is the this is who the Republicans are appealing to. So it's a real challenge for us to figure out how to bring the benefits of sustainability into red states and rural red counties and to change a lot of these mentalities. Good point. Yeah, I'm, I'm reminded of that rural city split is so critical, right? And that is such an important part of the American identity, um, right? It, it is, it is, it goes all the way back to the Civil War, pre-Civil War. I mean, it is as, it is as old as this country is, this sort of uh, traditionally agricultural um, sort of uh, sort of economy versus this sort of city and and this chip on the shoulder of the rural economy of that the that the, that this that the city looks down on them right and that and so that and then sort of a redoubling down on some of those values those conservative the, the sort of rural values that, are, that we that we that we associate now with church with uh, with guns mm-hmm. with and and these and so and and it's tough it's tough but i do think sean that like in this infrastructure bill you see stuff and i think that's why it's so critical and they've been highlighting this and i think there's a reason why the uh the broadband in the rural broadband mm-hmm. upgrades that is so critical because first of it all it'll, br- it'll it'll bring folks into the real world right the world that the rest of us live in online <laughs> half of our world is online right these folks are not part of that world so they are their their worlds are already small and now we the day air they can't even get out through the internet into the real world into the rest of the world that is really really important again make the stakes valuable to them personally mm-hmm. and then the jobs thing we keep coming back to the jobs the jobs thing is critical right make the job that people want good jobs and those and there aren't good jobs out there right there's like five good jobs in like this one town right <laughs> everyone else has no job or lives off lives yeah. li- is, is is collecting uh gov- money from the government it's it, it's right this is what this is how these communities have especially with the manufacturing gone these communities have collapsed 
I'm curious, Justine, uh, you've walked the beat in your work, right? You've, you've talked to these communities. Do you, what do you see about this, this urban rural dynamic or these, these particularities around urban er, uh, rural areas, I should say, uh, have you, do you have anything like that you could share with us? Any kind of thoughts? Um, well, just building on the the story about the county commissioner from rural Pennsylvania, I uh-huh. I said, mm-hmm. well, I'm I'm highlighting 30 different green jobs projects in my book, and he's like, oh, I'd love to see them. I'll email it right to you, and he's looking through, and because they they know they need to do retraining, they need to train the people have been laid off for different jobs and the department of labor had been sending them like $3 million for the county to train um, coal, coal miners for, for other things. But it was all about software development, writing apps for. Oh yeah. <laughs> those guys aren't going to do that. No, nah, those guys aren't doing that. <laughs> no one's attending the training and it's spending, they're spending a lot of money to do it. Yeah. Like, oh, your alternatives. Well, we could be sequestering more carbon complete silence on the other end of the phone. <laughs> like I gave him some projects to think about energy efficiency retrofits, building deconstruction. And it seemed like he needed to think about it. I, I just think there's there's a larger issue here in, in we were talking about the interregnum uh-huh. in terms of we're in this time between kings. And and really since Reagan came into office, we've been told government can't do any, anything right. We just need to shrink it. And, and we haven't really been investing in our country. And so that's why yeah. it's such a shock to see, you know, Trump was talking about infrastructure investments and didn't do anything. Um, and, and now Biden's really putting his money where his mouth is in terms of, you know, I loved Amtrak. I love taking Amtrak from home to D.C. every day. Yeah. And <laughs> we could have a high speed rail network like Europe and China and Japan and lots of other places developed nations do. I, I just think. We need to challenge this mindset that this is going to cost a lot of money. Well, you know what's going to happen to this money? It's going to become a paycheck for somebody. It's going to go in their bank account and go right back out to pay their bills. And then have, we'll have the multiplier effect through their economy. But I mean, from, from a deeper perspective, if we want to tie back in the, the just transition, the, the racial justice issue, in California, we're spending $80,000 a year to keep people locked up. Mm, yeah. Know, when people serve their debt to society in their release, if they can get a job that pays at least ten dollars an hour, there's a there's a much lower recidivism rate than if they can't find something. So the recidivism rate is about sixty five percent in California. Wow. If somebody finds a job that pays at least ten dollars an hour, it's eight percent. Wow! wow. So yeah. Instead of spending eighty thousand dollars a year to keep people, people locked up, and thirty four percent of prisoners are catching COVID at this point, instead, once they serve their debt to society, let's give them jobs. Let's create jobs for them: building deconstruction, driving food over to homeless shelters, recycling. Like there's restoring forests. There's all kinds of work that we could be doing that they could be doing. That even if you pay them half of what it costs to keep them locked up, we're still saving money and. Yeah. We're, we're yeah, and building this just transition. If you paid them half, that would be twenty bucks an hour, right? So you you have a situation where this we talked about this a lot in our show about money and um, mm-hmm. uh, that you know modern monetary theory specifically and the federal jobs guarantee. And this is a point that needs to be made over and over again that Republicans just hate. But red ink for the government, government borrowing is black ink for the economy. And so yeah. well, these people are going, oh, it's going to cost, <laughs> it's going to cost so much money, but there's a gusher of that money then going into the economy to help people. I know. <laughs> so important. Pay and pay their bills. Yeah. Well, and instead, instead of f- finding jobs and helping, you know, uh, people coming out of prison, finding jobs, what we're doing is just trying to stop them from voting. Right. Yeah, exactly. Right. That's, exactly. Where That's, the That's where we're at. That's where we're at. That's where we're at. Anyway, this has been an amazing conversation. Do you have anything else you want to add before we kind of shut close things down here? Justine, any funny concluding thoughts? Oh, wow. I just, I, <laughs> I wish we, let's see, which one? Um, <laughs> four years ago, my family and I did a big tour of Europe. We went to a lot of cities, Copenhagen and Berlin and Paris and Madrid. And in Northern Spain, we went on a tour of a cathedral that was, built in the 14th century and i'm walking around thinking man people like six centuries ago were thinking about our well-being and you know, yeah. the, the architect and, and the the patrons and the workers 
they knew the cathedral wouldn't be finished within their lifetime, and yet they started working on it as kind of a gift to us, to future generations. So people centuries ago were thinking about us. And I was walking around thinking, oh, what are we doing for generations six centuries from now? Are, are we thinking about their well-being? Are we thinking about, I want more toys? Yeah. Yeah. But, then, but then the more I thought about it, walking around looking at this beautiful Gothic cathedral with its pointy windows, I thought, you know, we, we're trying. We're putting in solar panels and windmills. We're trying to recycle. I have modern plastics, but... You know, we're trying. It's just not at the level it needs to be. So now's no. the time to to make the investment, which will pay off for our children. And maybe if maybe some debt will come out of it that they need to pay, but if they benefit from it, it's worth it. But just giving tax cuts to billionaires isn't any gift to the future. So yeah. what do we want that gift to be for for our grandchildren and our great grandchildren, so that they have it at the very least a habitable planet. I mean, that's what we're looking. That's where the, we are in the crossroads right now. We yeah. want to leave a habitable planet or are we just going to buy as much stuff as we can to fill our home? That's a very humane and ethical way of looking at it. And a great point. Thank you. Uh, uh, Christoph, Sean, you folks have anything you want to add before we... I just want to expand a little bit on Justine's point about the future. Mm -hmm. And of course, we know the, the, the Native Americans and a lot of other people uh, think in seven generations. And there was a point in your book, Justine, where you talked about certain companies that have an empty seat at their boardroom table for the future generations. Mm -hmm. And so they actually all consider, well, how would the future view this policy or this decision that we're making right now? And then they all kind of go and they, they they figure out how that person would vote and then they give that vote a certain amount of weight. And I think, I mean, boy, if we couldn't do that in every aspect of society, I mean, it's just that that would just be amazing how, how much that would change. That's that's brilliant. And yeah, um, that is really brilliant and and, and well put, Sean, and well put, Justine. And um, it's just it's I don't have much else to add other than it's been a, really just a great conversation and uh, more than once I got goosebumps while we're talking because it's it 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 feels good to think about the future in a active and productive way and and also the it's it's an exciting time to be in this fight because there is real change on the horizon one way or another. And there's something very uh, sort of exciting about that. And um, as I said, I'm an Obama Democrat, and so I'm optimistic about it. Thanks for being here, Justine. Uh, we can't thank you enough for being here. We plan more content on environmental issues on and sustainability and technological change. And we talk about how they're related to secularism and social justice, as we do here. Uh, please come back some other point. I would love to have you right. again. Um, so, you. you're welcome. Anyway, if you like our show, make sure you subscribe, leave a review, check the radicalsecular.com, tell your friends to listen. New episodes post Mondays at noon Eastern on YouTube and all the major podcast channels. If you're into reading, check out the blog at the radicalsecular.com. I'm Joe Kipinti. Thank you for being here. And remember, wherever you are, you can be radically secular.